What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled, as always, by the great folks at Nerd Tees. we got a brand new blend to tell you about once again today, and welcome to week 16 of my weekly CFL pick show for the 2018 CFL regular season and postseason, and uh, my YouTube channel is on a shirt. What is life? We were only average picking the CFL in week 15, did really good straight up, picked three of the four games correctly, going three and one. That has us 36, 21, and 0 straight up on the season. That's a 63% clip. Needs to be better, but at least it's trending in the right direction. Against the spread, even money. We were two and two. That has us 29 and 28 on the season. That's only 51%. That's not good enough. We want to start climbing towards the 54s and the 55s running out of real estate here. Over under only 1 and 3, one of our wor- worst weeks, one of our worst weeks at the very least, over under. So 1 and 3 has us at 29 and 26 with the two pushes, that's also only 51%. Overall, we treaded water. We were 6 and 6 across all of our picks in the CFL in week 15. That has us 94.75 with the two pushes. I need that number to get closer to 60. That, of course, also takes into account the two pushes that you have to count as losses because they're not wins. Update you on the CFL standings in the East Division. Ottawa now has a two-game lead in the East. They're at 8-5, two-game lead over 6-7 Hamilton. Ottawa outscoring opponents 25-23. Hamilton outscoring opponents 28-25. Toronto and Montreal still each only have three wins on the season. Toronto has those three wins in 12 games, Montreal in 13. Toronto being outscored by opponents 31 to 22 on the season, Montreal being outscored by opponents 31 to 17. In the West, Calgary still has a two game lead. In the West Division, they are at 10 and 2, outscoring opponents 32 to 21. And I believe there are scenarios this week where if Calgary wins, they lock up the division. Saski is in second place, Saskatchewan at 8 and 5 on the season. Scoring is even 26 to 26. Edmonton now drops to 7 and 6, outscoring opponents 28 to 26. They are in third in the West Division. Fourth is now, again, BC. They leapfrogged Winnipeg a week or two back, I think. BC in even 6-6, six and six, scoring even as well, 25-25. to 25. Winnipeg still pulling up the rear in the West Division at 6-7, and seven, but still outscoring opponents by 5 points, 30-25. to 25. Four games on tap this week. The Toronto Argos travel to Calgary to face the West Division leading Stampeders. BC travels to Hamilton, rematch of the game last week that BC won in double overtime. A great game last week. BC this time traveling to Hamilton to take on the Ticats. We've got Winnipeg traveling to Edmonton to take on the Eskimos again. And Saski goes to Montreal to take on Johnny Manziel and the Alouettes. I'm hoping the brightness on the video is okay because it's another gray, rainy, dreary day trying to do one of these videos. Not a ton of light in here. Hopefully it looks all right. We're going to start in Calgary where the Toronto Argos will be in town to take on the Stamps. Argos losers of their last four games and still looking for their first win on the road. Argos coming off a one-point loss last week to Saskatchewan, just 30-29. to Very close game. Argos go on a 15-6 run in the second half of that game. Just falls a little bit short. It's very hard to overcome giving up 24 points in the first half. Big game for McLeod Bethel-Thompson at quarterback. He threw for 73%, over 320 yards, added four carries for 25 yards on the ground, but did not score a touchdown and did throw an interception. And this goes back to kind of my philosophy about football in general, I guess, but certainly in the CFL. Good teams score touchdowns. Bad teams settle for field goals. And on the field goal front, Zachary Medeiros, who kicks for the Argos, not very often we talk about kickers, Zachary Medeiros missing a game-winning field goal at the end of this game The Argos were in position to win this football game. Medeiros, boom, kicks it wide. He, in fact, missed two field goals in this game. That's the difference. That's the difference right there. Argos should have won this game by five or six. And it wasn't just an isolated incident either. Medeiros has missed at least one field goal in three of his last four games. We go back to, you know, bad, mediocre teams settle for field goals instead of touchdowns. Well, not if your kicker is missing field goals. 
Let's look at the Stampeders now, who picked up the win last time out. They are unbeaten on home field. They are 6-0 and this season. Coming off that 43-28 win against Hamilton, that was back in Week 14. Calgary puts up a blank in the first quarter, but they reel off 20 points before the half and then go on a big 23-9 run after halftime. When this Calgary team gets rolling, it's almost impossible to stop them. At this point, I've come to accept that I'm living in a world where Bo Levi Mitchell can be mediocre and the Stamps still win. Bo Levi Mitchell, another game where he's throwing for under 60%. It's it's unbelievable to me how Calgary can be this good while their quarterback can be so average in certain aspects. Special teams certainly helped them in that game a couple weeks ago. An 83-yard punt return touchdown from Terry Williams. That's points on the board on special teams. Coaches love that stuff. And there's also the potential that Don Jackson at running back could come back either this week or any week now. And once Don Jackson comes back, Calgary's going to have a real lethal one-two punch there with Romar Morris. Morris went for 16 carries, 98 yards, and a touchdown in that game two weeks ago. Is this game not like the trappiest of all trap game scenarios? Winless team on the road, unbeaten team at home. Uh, Oh my God, the underdog, the underdog. Sure, it's the trappiest of trap scenarios, but come on. Obviously, I'm on the Stampeders in this one. Let's take Calgary at home. I think they're going to maul Toronto, honestly. I I don't think Toronto has much of a shot in this game whatsoever. We're going to be on Calgary big time, and we're going to hammer Calgary. I like the Stampeders. Minus 13 and a half on the line. 13 and a half point favorites at home. Toronto, this is an interesting stat that I dug up as I was doing my deep dive. Toronto in Friday night games. And in the CFL, if you're not familiar, Friday night football is a big deal. In Friday night games, in Toronto's last 14 Friday night games, they have covered the spread twice. 2-12 and 12 against the spread in their last 14 games on Friday. We're going to hammer Calgary and go minus the 13 and a half. Total in the game is 53 points. I'm going to tell you to stick under on it. The two teams are only a combined 10 and 13 over under, so it's a slight trend towards the under. But there's also the risk that we're going to get snow in this football game. Like, there's a possibility it's going to be cold. We're talking about like 3 degrees, 4 degrees, and if it dips a little lower than that, Celsius, of course, I'm going to play it safe here, and I'm going to go under 53 points in Toronto, Calgary. We're going to go to Hamilton now in a rematch from a game last week that took place in BC. This time the BC Lions will be in Hamilton taking on the Tiger Cats. BC winners of their last three straight games. They're only one and five on the road this season. They have not been a good road team whatsoever, but they're certainly going in a particular direction, certainly trending upwards. And when you're looking at Hamilton, they're not. They're going in the opposite direction. They've lost two games in a row. They are an average team at home. They're only three and three, so they're certainly not lighting the world on fire. Last week, this was a 35-32 to decision for the BC Lions in a game that went to double overtime. One of the most exciting finishes in the CFL that I can remember, certainly like, you know, regulation time finishes. There were 50 points scored in this game in the second half. This was trending towards an under at halftime. 50 points in the second half, 32 of those 50 points Belong to the BC Lions. They scored two touchdowns after the three-minute warning in the fourth quarter, which is the same as the two-minute warning in the NFL. It's just a minute earlier. And that was a frustrating loss for the Ticats. They win the game on the ground. They win the turnover battle. They were the more disciplined team. They just lose a tough road game against a team that plays incredibly well in their own building. The Lions defense generated five sacks on Jeremiah Masoli, and I talked about it when I previewed the game last week, that BC gets the second most or the most maybe sacks in the CFL. Hamilton gives up the second most, so Hamilton can't lose the game at the line, and it was exactly what they did. Lions get five sacks on Masoli, probably trying to make up for the fact that they took five penalties for 109 yards just on the defense. And if you're the Tie Cats, how many more times does your franchise quarterback have to get hit before you realize, geez, maybe we better protect this guy? One thing BC was not able to generate in that game last week was much of anything on the ground. For any player that was not a quarterback, 
on the offensive side for the BC Lions, it was only 14 carries for 63 yards. That's barely over four yards to carry. Not, just not quite good enough. Like four yards to carry in the NFL is great, but, well, maybe not great, but it's certainly very good. But you need a little bit more in the CFL. You just didn't quite get much of a run game there. So the BC Lions went out and made a trade just yesterday, I believe it was, made a trade with the Montreal Alouettes to acquire Tyrell Sutton. Now, Tyrell Sutton was Montreal's leading rusher so far on the season. He only has one rushing touchdown, but he's accumulated the most yards on that team. So they went out, made a deal, gave up a draft pick, brought a draft pick back, but gave up a better one to try and improve that run game a little bit. And it's nice because it's them realizing like, hey, we got a shot to make the playoffs here. Speaking of the run game, if we look on Hamilton's side, the absence of Alex Green definitely, definitely felt on the tie cat sideline. John White in relief. That's funny. White and green. We got a real color thing going. Anyway, John White comes in just 3.3 yards per carry in that game last week. A long rush of just 11 yards. Carried the ball 19 times. He did score a touchdown, but then you need more. Like you won the ground game despite this, I would say. You need, you need more. You just need more on the ground. Alex Green can provide that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is going to be the same defensive line against the same offensive line this week, so why would I think anything would go any differently? Even though the situation improves for Hamilton vastly, going from a road game to coming in playing at home against a team that's been bad on the road, I can't personally take Hamilton until they prove that they can protect their quarterback. And throughout the season, they've not really been able to prove that, certainly not lately. This would be my upset special this week, but I mean, I definitely have to go with the BC Lions here as the underdog for the upset. I'm going to take BC in Hamilton to beat Masoli and the Ticats. On the line, BC, a seven-point dog on the road. Hamilton favored by a full touchdown at home, despite the fact that they just got beat last week. Obviously, I can't take that because I like BC to win. So I'm on BC plus seven. It's also worthwhile to point out the BC Lions are 7-4 and four against the spread this season. Ticats are under 500 at 5-6-1. and one. It's not much of a lean, but it's a little bit of a lean. Total in the game is 51 points. I'm going to lean under on this one as well. The two teams are only a combined 9-13-1 on the over-under so far this season. So only 9 of 23 games total have gone over. There's also the potential for rain in the forecast. So if it starts to rain, points don't tend to pile up on the scoreboard under 51 points in BC Hamilton. Before we move on here, I'm going to take the time, as I do every week, to plug our good friends at NerdTees, nerdtees.ca. Use that promo code BWFINEST. Going to save yourself 15% at checkout. If you're in Canada, free shipping on any order over 50 bucks. If you're in the U.S., one little click of a button, all of a sudden all the prices are in U.S. dollars. You get a great conversion rate on the U.S. dollar right now. Never been a better time. Today, once again, it's a brand new blend this week. This blend is called Kiwi Licious. Just a new one that I wanted to try. Once again, it's smooth. It's flavorful. It's got a really, really, really nice taste to it. Steep it for about three, four minutes. Nerdtees.ca. Use that promo code BWFINEST. It's going to save yourself 15% at checkout. Free shipping on any order in Canada, over 50 bucks. Great conversion from the U.S. Find yourself something to love or find someone you love something to love. Nerdtees.ca. Let's go to Edmonton now. Eskimos find themselves, you know, now in third place in the West Division. They certainly have some work to do. They have to welcome the Winnipeg Blue Bombers into town. We'll start with Winnipeg. They won the last time out. They are only 2-4, and four, however, on the road, so they're certainly a beatable road team. Winnipeg coming off that aforementioned 31-14 win over the Montreal Alouettes. It was a Millhouse Max bomb. Thank you very much, Mill. We all made some money on that, I would say. Back-to-back scoring drives, however, late in this football game are basically what won it for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. They put back-to-back drives late in this football game. That game was closer than the final score would indicate, but the final score was what the final score was. I called him out in the episode last week, and ha, Andrew Harris finds pay dirt for the first time since week 10 against Ottawa. However, he did only touch the ball nine times. Still only that you get this. 
got to be something going on there. And I'm still not finding many people, if anybody, talking about it. Blue Bombers generate five sacks on defense. Makes sense. Montreal's protection is terrible. Three of those come from defensive lineman Craig Rowe, who also led the team in tackles with seven. Very good performance there. And incredibly disciplined performance by the Blue Bombers as well. Only one penalty taken as a team. It was one penalty for 10 yards on the defense. Eskimos lost a decision by two possessions to the Red Blacks last week. They're losers of one in a row. However, they are 5-1 and one at home. That loss to Ottawa came in the fashion of a 28-15 to defeat last week, but that was a three-point game heading into the fourth quarter. Very close, very winnable football game for the Eskimos heading into the final frame, but in that final frame, the offense absolutely disappeared. In the fourth quarter, the Eskimos generated just 108 yards of offense, which is only not even one full length of a CFL football field. Mike Riley threw an interception. Mike Riley fumbled the football. They also had a turnover on downs in the fourth quarter. You cannot have basically three turnovers in the fourth quarter in a three-point game and expect to win. The Eskimos' defense gave up a ton of yardage in that football game, but even if it didn't look like it, the defense honestly did a pretty good job. They did the job that they have to do. 21 of the Red Blacks' 28 points in that game came off of field goals. So what's a defense's job? Really, when you boil everything down, a defense's job is to keep the big scores, the big amounts of points off the board and give the offense a chance to win the football game. In my opinion, the Eskimos did that on defense in this game, forcing Ottawa to have to kick seven field goals. Like, yeah, sure, they were in position to kick seven field goals. The yardage was an issue, but they kept the touchdowns off the board. And that was the big thing for me. They generated six sacks in that football game. They had an interception. They only gave up the one touchdown in the fourth quarter to Ottawa. So, I mean, I feel like the defense did their job. Where the Eskies got let down as a team was on the offensive side, and the run game, even though C.J. Gable came back, they still had absolutely no run presence in this football game whatsoever. Gable had six carries, just 52 yards. Why is he only carrying the ball six times? I guess maybe easing him back into things, but still. That shows that if Mike Riley struggles, even comparatively to Mike Riley, Riley only went 66% passing, 276 yards, which is fine, one touchdown, one interception, added six yards on four carries, goal line touchdown, because that's what Mike Riley does. But if Mike Riley struggles comparative to Mike Riley, they're in deep trouble in your average football game. This is a football game that does set up for the Edmonton Eskimos to win. It's a good situation for them at home against a subpar road team. And all I can say is they better because now not only are they third in the division, BC is right on their tail. If BC wins this week, which I think they're going to, they're at seven wins. They're right there with Edmonton. So not only do they see the two teams ahead of them, but one behind them is coming up strong. I think Edmonton has to be in desperation mode from here on out. I'm going to take the Eskies as the more desperate team to win this football game. I like Edmonton at home to beat Winnipeg. On the line, Edmonton favored by 6.5 points at home. Typically, I would think, you know what, it's less than a touchdown. Really good offense. Edmonton wasn't a really good offense last week. I think i got to go Winnipeg plus 6.5 here, hedging my bets because... Winnipeg has to be a desperate team too. They're under 500. They're last place in this division, but it's still within reach. So both of these teams, I guess you can say, are desperate. I just look at Edmonton as being maybe a little bit more. It's too many points for me. Neither one of these teams are great teams against the spread. So let's take the six and a half points with the underdog. Go Winnipeg plus six and a half. Total in the game is 56 points. It's the biggest total we will look at this week. The two teams are a combined 14, 9, and 1 over under this season. So what is that? That's uh, 14 of 24 games have gone over. Slight trend. We'll take it. Let's go over the 56 points in Edmonton, Winnipeg. And the last game we're going to look at this week sees the Saskatchewan Rough Riders traveling to Montreal to take on Manziel and the Alouettes. Saskatchewan coming into this game having won last week. They're a very good road team at 4-2, and two, but this is back-to-back road games for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I talk about that extensively 
in the NFL. I try to point it out every single time that I can. Back-to-back -back road games is a very difficult thing to do, especially to win both of them. Saski won last week, beat a mediocre team in Toronto. They're playing the other really mediocre team from the East Division, so they're set up on paper that they should win the game, but there's that specter of the back-to-back -back road game. Saskatchewan had the aforementioned 30-29 win over Toronto last week. Two more interceptions, though, from Zach Kalaros. More that I, than I would like to see. More, I'm sure, than Riders fans would like to see as well. Just 56% passing. I look at that game like, you know, Sasky survived that football game. They didn't, they won the game, but they survived that game. Because remember, Medeiros had to miss two kicks, including the one right at the end of the game, in order for Saskatchewan to win that game. Outside of a massive 82-yard touchdown run from Marcus Thigpen, which just seems to be what he does, these long, rumbling touchdown runs, but outside of that run, just 3.9 yards per carry on any other rush by any other Rough Riders player, that was only 16 carries, is the pass game enough? Because clearly, they're really not focused on the run game. Last week was also the Rough Riders' second straight game being beaten in time of possession. It wasn't by a ton. I think it was only by a few seconds. But that is the kind of thing that could start to matter against better competition. The Alouettes come into this game losers of two straight, having won just one of their six home games this season. Not a very good road team. I mean, not a very good team in general for most of the season, but certainly not a good home team. Al's come in off of that 31-14 loss to Winnipeg last week. That, like we said, the final score doesn't really tell the whole story. It was a relatively competitive game until the fourth quarter. Manziel was adequate. Now we're at the point where we got to start asking Johnny Manziel to finish, to score touchdowns, whether it's with your legs, whether it's with the arm. That's the next step. you got to become a finisher in this league if you really want to impress people. They won yardage in this game. They played the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and had more yards than the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. That is a feat because Winnipeg's offense is pretty darn good at moving the ball. They had more yards. They had better time of possession. They won on first down. They won on the ground with the exception of touchdowns. Winnipeg scored two rushing touchdowns. Montreal only scored one. But I'm still going to give them the W because they had more yards, more yards per carry, everything like that. They were more effective moving the ball on the ground. But then you see them going back and making the same mistakes. They lost the turnover battle. They turned the ball over twice. They did not generate any turnovers of their own. They took nine penalties. That's too many. They gave up five sacks on the quarterback. That's too many. So it just goes right back to it. Protection and penalties. Protection and penalties. It's the same problems that just haven't quite been addressed yet. You can see how some things are coming up, but there's still obviously a lot of work to do. The Alouettes clearly feel like they found their guy in the backfield with William Stanbeck. They felt confident enough to pull the trigger on that trade with BC, sending them Tyrell Sutton, bringing back a better draft pick in exchange, improving their position in the draft. I think Millhouse might have said it in the CFL chat, you know, what a, what a great asset, a second round CFL draft pick. But I mean, look, within the context of the league, if you get better in the draft, that, that, that can't help but be a good thing. I guess as long as you use the pick correctly. I recommend on the offensive line. Saski is a better team on the road than Montreal is at home. I you got I got to go with Saski in this one. They're a better football team. Kalaros, I don't think will throw multiple interceptions again. I don't think anyway, but uh, I, I got to go to Eski here as the better football team. On the line, Montreal are six and a half point dogs at home. And I think I'm actually going to take that. Uh, Montreal, they're an even money team against the spread, despite the fact that they're only three and 10. They are six and six against the spread, six, six and one, I suppose. And they covered a similar number to this at home in week 11. Granted, that was against Toronto, but it was when Toronto was playing better football. So uh, six and a half points, it strikes me as like, Saski could very easily win this game by six, but that still covers Montreal six and a half. So look, maybe, and I don't know, maybe I'm just leaning towards a team that I like here, but I'm going to go Montreal plus six and a half. Total in the game is 48 points. Uh, Saski and Toronto went over last week. Toronto and Montreal are very comparable teams offensively. Toronto's better, but they're comparable teams offensively. I feel like this is, by, by virtue of being the lowest number of the week, I feel like this could go over by like a field goal or so. I feel pretty comfortable going over on this one. Let's go over 
the 48 points in Montreal, Saskatchewan. All right, folks, there you go. CFL Week 16 picks. They are in the books. Let's give you the picks here one more time. I like Calgary at home to put a loss on the Argos. I like Calgary minus 13 and a half against the spread in a game that stays under the 53 point total. I like BC on the road in Hamilton to beat the Thai Cats because they can't protect Masoli. I like BC plus seven on the line, regardless of who you think wins the football game. And I think the game stays under the 51 point total. I like Edmonton at home to beat Winnipeg. Must win game for both teams, I would argue. But I do like Winnipeg plus six and a half against the spread. Hedging my bets on that one a little bit in a game that goes over the 56 point total. And the last game of the week, I like Saskatchewan in Montreal to beat the Alouettes. But I'm going to take Montreal plus six and a half points against the spread in a game that goes over 48 points. Week 16 picks are now in the books. I hope you enjoy the games this week. I hope you watched the NFL Week 4 video. I hope you've enjoyed that one as well. That's it for me. Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the great folks at Nerd Tees, and now wearing a shirt that has my YouTube channel and all my socials on the back of it as well. It's just something I wanted to throw together to sort of wear in videos, something I think I'm going to like having as a branding thing on the videos. Enjoy the games this week. It'll be another great week of football across the board and across the borders. We'll see you again for Week 17.